Hello, this is Kathleen Ralph, creator of the webcomic Hope and Harry. I know how important support is for creators, which is why I support Andy and Derek and the Comics Alternative through Patreon. This is the Comics Alternative webcomics. Reviews of Delilah Dirk and the King's Shilling, Rexstar, and Weapon Brown. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Web Comics. I'm Derek. And I'm Sean. And we're two guys with advanced degrees talking about web comics. That's right. And for January, we got some great web comics to share with you guys. We're going to start off with Tony Cliff's Delilah Dirk and the King's Shilling. After that, Joey Cruz and Michelle Nguyen's Rexstar. And then we're going to conclude with an already completed webcomic, Jason Youngbluth's Weapon Brown. But before we get into those discussions, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Webcomics is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some wonderful specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off of the cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover price, but often the discounts are more impressive than that. And we also want to direct you to their sister website, MyDigitalComics.com, where they have all their digital comics available. Uh, you know, they've got uh, a great selection of stuff there, as always. And one of the things I've not mentioned before, I'm pretty sure, in, in previous uh, touting of them, is they do have quite a f bunch of free uh, comics available to test out and try, get your feet wet with the, you know a first issue or a zero issue or something like that. Uh, including, and I want to, uh, I have a personal affection towards several of the Tomorrow's magazine titles, Alter Ego, Back Issue, Jack Kirby Collector, that type of thing. Uh, and I have to admit, in part, because I do write for Jack Kirby Collector as well. But uh, all, all great stuff to pick up, and like I said, uh, uh, a good, good selection of free material available uh, if you want to try out some of these new titles that, that you may not have read before. That's right. So if you like your comics digitally or in hard copy form, you can't go wrong with the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, or their sister company, mydigitalcomics.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with advanced degrees sent you. And, of course, we also want to point out our uh, other newer advertiser, uh, Just Coffee Co-op. That's right. Just Coffee Co-op. They have great selections of coffee, and all of their coffee is 100% fair trade, shade-grown, and organic certified. They do everything in small batches, roast to order, no mass production at all. And if you use the coupon code COMIC, C-O-M-I-C-S, when you check out, You'll get a 10% discount off of your order plus free shipping. Uh, so just use the coupon code COMICS on your checkout there and uh, get some nice bonuses, uh, which tells them that we sent you there, too. That's right. So their website is justcoffee.coop. That's just coffee, one word, C-O-O-P. Go there. They have a great selection of coffee, and it's a great way to get caffeinated. So, Sean, this is the first webcomic episode of 2016. How was your new year? It was good. Very busy. Very busy. Uh, one of the reasons uh, I, we're recording a little bit later than we, we would normally like to, though, is, uh, is I was very busy down in Florida this year, uh, right, or first uh, week or so 
of the year, I ran the Dopey Challenge through Walt Disney World. Okay, so you, you've told me off mic, but explain to our listeners what is the Dopey Challenge. Well, you know, uh, Walt Disney World, they, they have a bunch of races uh, throughout the year. Uh, you know, there's uh, Star Wars race themed races and, and princess themed races, that kind of thing. And you're talking about um, running, right? Yes. Marathon running, yeah. Uh, like actual, uh, you know, feet on the ground running, running races. Um, the Dopey Challenge is interesting because uh, the first, usually the first or second weekend in January every year, they have a series of four races in uh, Walt Disney World. And the first one is a 5K on the Thursday, and the second one is a 10K on the Friday, and then they have a half marathon on Saturday, and then a full marathon on Sunday. And if you run all four of those races, that's what they call the Dopey Challenge, because you have to be dopey to run the f- total grand total of 48.6 miles uh, over the course of those four days. Uh, and the, the courses all wrap through the various theme parks, uh, Magic Kingdom and Epcot and Animal Kingdom and, and Hollywood Studios and all that. Um, and lots of characters out there to, to cheer you on, Mickey and Donald, Goofy, all, and a lot of obscure ones, too, that you just run by and go, who the heck was that? Um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I highly recommend it, if you're, particularly if you're a Disney fan, uh, and a great experience as, as a runner if you're out there. So you've been spending the past several days resting up. You know, actually, interestingly enough, uh, I finished the marathon last week, and the next day, my wife and I went back to uh, Animal Kingdom and walked around the park and did that and and went to Epcot for the fireworks in the evening and the whole bit and almost no rest whatsoever. So uh, I, I take it as a good sign that my legs are in pretty good shape right now. <laughs> well, good. Well, congratulations on the, the, the dopey run. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. How about you? What was You did some traveling yourself, didn't you? Yeah, since you and I last recorded the December webcomics episode, I was up not too far from your neck of the woods, uh, went up to northern Indiana, uh, where I have uh, in-laws, and so that's where we spent our Christmas, and I know that you and Gene and I had kind of flirted around with the possibility of getting together while I was up in that area, but we just couldn't arrange it. Ah, uh, yeah, it's t- uh, the one downside about... Uh the holiday time is it just gets very hectic and schedules get get very conflicted very quickly yeah but you know next time i'm up there we all three ought to get together and who we can also rope into that meeting is gwen tarbox because she is up in kalamazoo not that far away yeah that's only a couple hours from from where i am right now yeah so maybe we can have in the near future a comics alternative gathering i like the sound of that that's yes. uh, we have to plan that for maybe the spring or summer yeah Uh, so we've got a lot of comics to discuss on this month's episode, so let's go ahead and jump into it. We're going to begin with Delilah Dirk and the King's Shilling, and this is written by Tony Cliff. Now, this is one that – a title that I was familiar with because uh, Andy Wolverton wrote a review of – Delilah Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant when it first was published through First Second, and that's been over a year ago. But I haven't read Delilah Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant. Now, have you read that first book? Yeah, well, I I didn't read the book version, but I read that he uh, Tony Cliff did the same thing that he's doing this one in that he released it as a web comic initially, and I read it as it was being serialized, and then. Uh, once it was published by first second, then he pulled down everything I think, but like say the first chapter or so. Um, so I haven't ad- read the physical hard copy, but I read it as a web comic as he was uh, releasing it originally. Okay, so you read all of it o- online. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the reason I'm asking is um, I have again I have not read that first book, and if I go to the website now, and we should mention that the website is. DeliahDirk.com. That's D E L I L A H D I R K.com. And there you can find a link to 
the first 80 pages of that first book, uh, Delilah Dirk and the uh, Turkish Lieutenant. Um, and then the second one, the one that we're going to be discussing, Delilah Dirk, is currently being serialized. But but this is interesting. Uh, yesterday, as fate would have it, uh, we got a tweet from Tony Cliff, and he had heard us mention this upcoming book on our January previews episode. So he wanted to say thanks for the shout out. And he had mentioned that he's going to be serializing uh, Delilah Dirk and the King Shilling until publication in March. So I didn't know if he had done the same thing with the Turkish Lieutenant, if that was serialized complete before the release, or if the release appeared before he had finished, so he only had those first however many pages would have been up. But you said that the entire thing had been up before the book's release from first second. Yeah, um, I, I don't know all of the background details on on you know how he got the agreement with with first second my guess though is that he actually he originally published this as a webcomic not having talked to first second at all and only after it was up and complete and then he i, I get the impression or nearly complete he started shopping that around and and first second said oh hey you know what this is really fantastic let's go ahead and publish this as a as a print edition that that's my impression and then so i think when he started uh, King Schilling, the second book, I think he had probably already had that inroad, so he was able to to talk with them and kind of get things set up a little bit farther in advance in terms of the of a preview versus webcomic version and that kind of thing. Oh, that's great! So he has a different strategy with his second book that he did with the first. That's I I, I think he does. I think he does. But like I said, I, I wasn't obviously I'm not privy to all the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, with the first book, but I, I, there was enough of a lag time between when it got completed online and when it was announced and then uh, eventually released that I think that, uh, like I said, I, I don't think he had any sort of agreement in place until uh, at least nearly the very end of, of serializing the first book. Okay. Well, <clears throat> now you've read the first one. I haven't, and I think that that's a great difference for us uh, in terms of approaching this new one, uh, Delilah Dirk and the King Shilling. I read the first, I think the first 56 as of this time of recording, the first 56 pages of the King's Shilling is available online. And I wondered if not having read that first book, I would be at a little of a loss in getting into this latest. Not at all. Uh, and in fact, if I didn't know about Delilah Dirk, that there was a previous volume, if no one had said anything to me about that and I just started to read Delilah Dirk and the King Shilling, I would have thought that this is a brand new property and I was starting from ground zero. Yeah, he does a, a really fantastic job of uh, you know, basic storytelling, right? You know, he's he's introducing all the characters. He he does a very good job of uh, showing who they are and how they interact and and you know what all those relationships are, uh, so that you don't really need to know everything that happened in the first book. Um, which I'll I'll throw out is it's it does serve as a very good introduction. It's it's called uh, you know Delilah Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant as who are their two main characters. And in that story, we basically see uh, uh, Delilah and Salim, uh, who are the primary characters here in King Shilling, uh, how they met, how they first get together, uh, and, and kind of the origin story of the two of them. Now, uh, Salim, he is the Turkish lieutenant? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so when we start the King Shilling, they're already partners. They're already, you know, they have a solid, fairly solid working relationship. Uh, you know, so the, the origin story is interesting and clever and stands on its own, but it's not necessary, as you pointed out, to, to really get into the King Shilling either. Yeah, exactly, because, you know, just starting with book two, it seems as if they are a team that's been working comfortably together for a while. And even if there is that backstory, it's something that, again, if I didn't know that there was this previous volume, I would just assume that at some point in this second book, that backstory would be revealed, uh, you know, in one form or another. So I think that's a great strategy uh, of storytelling. In that with a series like this, 
readers don't necessarily have to have read the previous volumes in order to understand what's going on here. And especially for a title such as this, because this is, I guess I'd call this an all-age comic. It It is for younger readers, but it's also for more mature readers as well, because it's, you know, from what I've seen with Delilah Dirk and the King Schilling, it's some sophisticated storytelling, but yet things are told in such a way that very young readers could get a lot out of this book. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, and part of that is you know it's uh, the all ages nature of things, right? So there's no you know overly adult situations or, or language or you know anything along those lines. Which exactly, and this is the stuff that First Second does best. I mean, they do or First Second every now and again does publish something that's a little more mature and adult, but more times than not, they do an outstanding job at all age titles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like I said, I don't know that that Cliff went to them, uh, or he he, I, he didn't go to the um, he didn't start the Delilah Dirk story. I don't think with first second in mind, but it fits in very well with their Uv, uh, Uber uh, in general. Exactly. Uh, so it looks like from his website that Delilah Dirk is going to be about two hundred and sixty pages, which is longer from book one which is about 180 pages. So, you know, again, I, I like what I see here. I'm looking forward to the complete book. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the Delilah Dirk storyline, um, specifically if they're not familiar with King Schilling, how would you describe the premise? Um, well, you know, we're just, like you said, we're only about 50-some pages into it as of right now. So we haven't gotten very deep into the plot yet. Uh, but Delilah Dirk is basically kind of the extra, uh, adventurer extraordinaire, right? She's an expert, expert swordsman and, and, and military strategist uh, and goes around essentially helping people. It's kind of, almost kind of a Lone Ranger-esque uh, a, a appearance, or not appearance, but uh, effect that she's got. And Salim acts as her sidekick, more or less, right? He's He's helping with the distractions while she's doing the main mission. He helps with... Uh, you know, some of the, the strategy of, you know, getting from place to place and the kind of the drudgery of uh, all the, the, the garbage that you have to deal with between the adventures. And he kind of handles all of that. Um, so what the, the premise of this story is, is apparently um, Delilah is framed for a murder that she didn't commit and then has to kind of clear her name but we haven't really gotten to that part of the story in the 50 some pages that we've looked at so far uh she's gone on an, uh, an, a, a saving adventure uh, rescuing a small child from her uh from his father who has kidnapped the child for his own purposes uh and then she's gotten into a scuffle here with uh with some military people who just kind of stumble across their encampment uh one day and that's about as far as we've got. So we haven't gotten too deep into the story yet. Um, yeah, exactly. Now, this takes place in the 19th century. And in fact, it opens, as we learn on the very first page, in Portugal in 1809. So here we're in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars. And in Portugal now, we find not only French troops, but also British as well. And in fact, it's the British troops that Delilah and Salim encounter in the most recent pages, again, as of our recording, uh, the most recent ones that are up online now. Um, so it's interesting because Delilah herself is of British descent, correct? Um, you know what? They never really – I don't recall them expressing that in the first volume at all, but they, they do kind of imply that certainly uh, here with the second. Right, and so it's it's perhaps ironic that the troops that they encounter early on are not the French, but their own, or at least Delilah's own, British brethren. And they're giving them a hard time, and as of the most recent page, 56, we don't know how things are going to end up in this scuffle. Well, I think uh, considering we still have another 200 pages to go, I think it's safe to say that Delilah gets out of it intact at least. <laughs> yes, I would, I would assume so. But, but we don't know exactly what's going to be the result of this because at first it just seems to be a chance encounter. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, who knows how things will unfold here. And, you know, and that's, that's one of the great things about an ongoing story like this. At the same time, it's a little frustrating, but I don't mean that in a negative way. It, it's frustrating in that – 
I like it so much. I want more. I just have to be patient and wait. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, but, um, you know, that one of the nice things is that also gives you time to uh, stop and appreciate what Cliff is doing. Um both in a storytelling perspective and just an illustration perspective. One of the mm-hmm. one of the things that I really love about his work is just the the illustrations he's got uh are just so fluid and so animated. Um you know, there's just a lot of expressiveness in every single panel throughout the entire seat, uh piece. Um it, it's absolutely fascinating to me to just kind of sit there and read through particularly something you know adventurous like the fight sequences and and that kind of thing what's going on and how people are moving um and he's got a very dynamic sense of uh the human body and and human anatomy yeah i agree i I love his action scenes but i also love the the detailed and the extravagance in his illustration style and one of my favorite examples from what we have with the king shilling so far is a two-page spread, and I guess this will be pages 39 and 40, at least that's what they're called online, and this is uh, kind of a, I guess, a, a brief fantasy. Salim is wanting to, to quit going on adventures, but for Delilah to return home so they can get some rest, really. And so at one point, Salim is describing to Delilah that, you know, hey, if you go home, then you can rest up. And then he's thinking people could honor us, uh, you know, being, you know, you coming home, the great adventurer. And there is this, again, a two-page spread where in her town, uh, they're drawn on the back of, uh, it looks like a a really long, large elk uh and uh, they're being paraded through the town there's a band there just a big parade scene uh fantastical in nature and and i love the way that um the the cliff illustrates this yeah it, it is really gorgeous and a lot of attention to, to to small details um you know the 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 way the straps are you know kind of going over this giant elk and holding the uh, I don't know the carriage, for lack of a better word, in place. Uh, you know how the the flagmen have little uh, support structures that are wrapped around their their torso to help hold up the flags because you know you wouldn't just hold them naturally. And uh, you know the footmen hold uh, carrying the I don't know, presumably king and queen or or the royals or whoever they are in or front. Or could be there. the mayor of the town. Could be the mayor. Yeah, the obviously important people. Uh, you know, there's a, just a lot of little subtle details in there that, that just, um, just make it look really fantastic, I think. Just absolutely gorgeous piece of work. Right. Uh, and at the same time, the the tone of the – or the tint of this two-page spread is lighter than other places in the comic so that the reader has no question that this is not actually happening. This is just a fantasy inside of Salim's head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I, I think that the, the art is masterfully done. Uh, and, and another thing I like about this, and I'm sure that I would appreciate what I'm about to say even more if I were familiar with the first book, is the complexity of character. Because, you know, just 50-some pages into The King Shilling, we can already see not only the dynamic relationship between uh, Delilah and Salim, but also... The, the the conflicts that go into each of these characters. So, for instance, when we see Delilah, you know, after she rescues the young boy, Paulo, and then takes Paulo to his mother and then grandfather, grandfather and grandmother, we see a side of her. We, we've already seen the heroic side of her, but then we see, I guess, the, the common everyday individual side of Delilah. At one point after she finishes eating at the table, she's picking her teeth. And I think it's the grandmother that looks over at her and Delilah realizes this and stops. Little things like that. Also, we see a bit of her in terms of the action, her impatience. Um, When she was rescuing Paolo from her father, uh, her father, in you know trying to to stop them, ends up shooting 
uh, Delilah in the arm, and that enrages her, and she wants to shoot him back. In other words, she wants to kill him because, as she tells Salim later, you don't just shoot Delilah Dirk and get away with it because then her reputation you know, will be tarnished, right? That someone could harm her like that. She's not the adventurer that is painted in many people's minds. But what Salim reminds her is it's a good thing you didn't kill him because then you would have completely ruined this job that we had. And so we, we see a bit of her in terms of her impatience and the complexities of her characters, that she has a little bit of the, uh, a little bit, maybe quite a bit of the ruffian in her. Uh, and, 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 you know, again, all of this may have come out, and I'm sure it did in that first book, but not having read it, I do appreciate the fact that Cliff is teasing out characterization even within the early pages of this second volume. Yeah, and you know what? It's uh, it's actually interesting. He's doing a lot more with um, Delilah herself in this volume than he did in the first, in terms of characterization. The first book, uh, she was already a pretty well-established character, right? Kind of charging in and being the hero and that kind of thing. Uh, and Salim was uh, more of a reluctant sidekick. And so a lot of the first book is largely about him coming to terms with uh, who Salim is, who, uh, who is right, who is wrong, what's good versus bad. You know, it's kind of, it's more of, it's honestly more of Salim's story. Uh, and we see the character change and grow over the course of that first book. Um, he's not, he's actually a, a fairly different character in, in a, yeah, I don't know, a somewhat different character in many respects in the first book than he is here in the second one. Here he's, he's more, uh, assured of himself, a more confident in what he's doing. Still a little, no, not a hundred percent perfectly confident in the way Delilah is. Um, but I, I, he's not as... Uh, kind of afraid of his own shadow that we kind of saw in the first book. So the the first book was more of a, a hero's journey for Salim uh, himself, and this second one kind of looks like it's going to spend more time on Delilah, which is which is interesting, kind of uh, flipping the tables on um, in who the you know you're following the the character, the title character, but it's really uh, about somebody else at least initially. Okay. Yeah. And as we mentioned, there are not that many pages up on the website yet. I mean, we're only at uh, 56 of what would be book pages. So I guess we can expect another month, maybe a month and a half's work worth of art to come out uh, before the actual book is released on March 8th. Yeah, uh, I believe uh, Cliff has said that he was basically going to serialize this book uh online through publication of the the volume from first second and if i remember correctly he's going to at that point pull down everything but essentially the first chapter or the first uh, preview section um, essentially the same that he did on the first book right so you'll still be able to read and get a sense of what's going on and who the characters are and and whether or not you want to uh, test it uh, or you get a chance to test it out before actually having to purchase the, the full book. Uh, Which is what we have up with the first book now. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, if you want to be in on it, one of the reasons why I suggested that we, we take a look at this one now is because it's still being serialized. So, you know, this would give any of our listeners a chance to go out and check that out uh, before it gets to publication you know, and they can read the the serialized serialized version uh, in real time before it gets that far. Right now, I was looking online. Maybe I missed it. Is there a schedule of when Cliff updates uh, his 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 site with a new installment? Uh, you know what? I think I'm, I'm I know they come out fairly regularly. I do not know that he's actually advertised at least on the site when that is and, and, and you know that's fine and we should mention because you know we try to do this on all of our webcomic episodes you know not only the story itself you know the story the art all of that uh, that goes into a webcomic but also uh, things like uh, the the frequency of the story going up and what the website looks like is there a commentary section all of that and you know the the main website uh, delilahdirk.com 
is the front page. If you click on the King Shilling, then you'll get to what Sean and I, you've been, you and I have been discussing mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the the story leading up to the publication of this next book. And I really like this in that. The browser window is just the two pages that he has up at a time with with the title and the chapter and page indicator at the top. That's it. So we, there's no commentary section. There are no ads. There's nothing like this. So in other words, you don't find the kind of clutter, if you want to call it that, that is so prevalent at, at times in, to a painful degree on many webcomic sites. So I like that because – in just looking at this in your line of vision is the comic itself and that's it well and the other thing he he does that a lot of people don't is he's you kind of alluded to it just now is he's presenting this in two page spreads mm-hmm. um a lot of people even when they're developing a a web comic with the intent that it will be published sooner or later still only put up one page at a time um, I, I think it's interesting that he uses the double page spread in every case, though, uh, because you get a larger chunk of the story. Yeah, which, did he do that with book one? Yes, yes. As he had the exact same format with book one when that was serialized, too. That's interesting, because what that suggests to me is that a creator who does that definitely has a print copy book in mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think probably most webcomic creators would like to see what they do come out in print, but they don't for, don't necessarily format the webcomic accordingly. But when you go to Delia Dirk and you see these two-page spreads, which is, you know, you, you liken it to opening a book and laying it in front of you, except it's on a screen, that tells me that the creator creator has immediately as an end goal, I'm going to get this published. I want this to be an actual hard copy book. And mm-hmm. the webcomic is a means for me to get that. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think it works particularly well with a story like Delilah Dirk um, because he's writing it as a graphic novel, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he's telling it as a full-blown story. He's got a beginning, middle, and end already in mind. And because of that, he knows that the the individual story chunks, from a reader's perspective, need to be a little bit longer, right? Uh, you know, if you if you tried to do this just one page at a time, you know, you're you're going to, as a reader, be, I think, a little. Uh, I don't want to say less engaged, maybe, but it makes it a little bit more of a diff- more difficult reading experience because you don't get enough of a chunk of the story to follow it easily from page to page, especially if, you know, his updates were only one page at a time. It's like I said, they're not here. He always does at least two pages. I th- want to say four, honestly, most times. Um but uh you know if if you're doing a kind of more dramatic story uh particularly with he does some uh uh decompressed storytelling elements uh from time to time too sequences um you know that that makes it very challenging and difficult to not have a larger piece of a story all in all at one go as a mm-hmm. reader yeah Well, let's move on to the second current ongoing webcomic that we're going to be discussing this month, and this is Rexstar. This is written by Joey Cruz with art by Michelle Nguyen, and you can find this one at rexstarcomic.com, and that's one word, R-E-C-K-S-T-A-R-C-O-M-I-C.com. It's updated every Tuesday, and this began not too long ago. Uh, the first installment went up in July of, uh, was it 2015? I guess 2015. 2015, yes. And then the most recent was just a few days ago, and we're just into Chapter 3. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, interesting story here in that uh, it's a, it's a more of a science fiction take. While uh, Delilah Dirk was 
Uh, definitely more in the fantasy realm. This is uh, science fiction. Starts out right off the bat with aliens and, and strange life A forms. A comedic space. science fiction. Comedic story. science fiction, yeah. And I think that's, uh, that's evident from right at the get-go. Um, it's basically, we're talking about uh, two characters who are freelance uh, delivery people, basically, right? Uh, you get whatever product you want from point A to point B, no questions asked, we'll get it done kind of, kind of guys. Um, but because there is actually a guild out there, uh, that makes some of their work a little bit more challenging. And uh, additionally, uh, the, well, I should point out that the two main characters, the, the one is... Uh, Thade Rexstar, hence the name of the comic itself, right? Uh, and the other one is, I'm drawing a blank at the moment, as soon as I said Finn that. Finn Wyoming. <laughs> Thank you, Finn Wyoming. Right. And Finn uh, is human, and Thade Rexstar is malarian. Uh, yes. An alien race, in other words. Yeah. And, and so it, it's an interesting relationship between these two because, you know, we mentioned this is kind of a comedic science fiction webcomic uh rexstar himself seems to be the straight man or the serious one and it's finn who is goofy uh the costello to rexstar's abbot if you will yeah i you know i i kind of like the the dean martin jerry lewis analogy a little bit better personally but <laughs> okay yeah, in fact early on when you were describing this to me as to what we could possibly discuss in january you did mention something about martin and lewis yeah i think uh i mean there's still the the straight man quality uh is pretty solid throughout any of those those groupings and you know we could go with any any comedy team from years past um uh, but i i think the the Jerry Lewis aspect is, is a little more interesting for, for the Finn Wyoming character because he's got – he's not uh, – something with a like a, a Lou Costello figure, he ends up being kind of more of a dimwit in a lot of cases. And Jerry Lewis was more – uh, he wasn't juvenile. so much a diff. Yeah, he was more just kind of wacky and juvenile as opposed to slow or stupid. Um, and and I think that is a lot of where Finn's coming from, right? He's got a lot of that uh, childish impishness and impulsiveness uh, of of a Jerry Lewis. He's he seems to be very capable as uh, at least. Um, uh, not a, he's Fade or Rexstar is the the pilot and Finn kind of goes along as co-pilot slash um, he's weapons the wingman. wingman a weapons expert that kind of thing and he actually seems fairly capable in that role mm -hmm. um, but the problem he runs into is like when they actually land on a planet and go to talk to some of their clients he'll misinterpret uh, some of the local customs or or uh, misunderstand uh, somebody's language or, or verbiage or something and misconstrue entire situations and create these kind of uh, realities in his own head that are totally improbable and implausible, which then get the two of them into wacky adventures and trouble of all sorts. Right. Uh, or we assume it will because this is a relatively new comic and there's really not as much to it as there usually is in most web comics that, that we look at for the show. But I think there's enough for us to definitely discuss. Uh, you know, another thing about this relationship is it's Finn's ineptness at times and his his juvenile way of looking at the world or his lack of social skills, let's say, because that's a big part of it as well, Sure, that uh, is an important component in the premise because you're right. They start off as freelance deliverers. Uh, you know, they'll do a job, you know, wherever they can find it. But then they want to become a part of this guild. And this first adventure that they're taken on, uh, I guess, in Chapter 2 is is when it begins, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, the the guild is trying them out. But the leader, and I can't remember the guy's name, but the leader that Rexstar talks with of this guild or the representative says, you know, if you get rid of Finn Wyoming, then we would have no problem of you working for us. But we're a little unsure about your abilities to complete this because of your sidekick that and your partner that you know is a little inept. He said so they give them a job that 
um, Rick Starr learns later that not many other people wanted, but they don't know why, um, in order to test out their, uh, you know, what they're able to deliver, literally and figuratively. So, um, so this is where we end up. They go to this planet that is surrounded by, or at least it's behind an asteroid belt, which is so it's difficult for Rexstar and Finn to get to. And so, you know, there's a lot of comedy involved in them actually getting down to the planet, you know, through all of the asteroids. Uh, but then there's some other complications along the way, and that that's basically where things leave off. Because if you look at the most recent installment, actually. Uh, the most recent installment was from the other day, and it is a uh, – it's not part of the main storyline, but it's uh, an homage to David Bowie. Mm-hmm. Sure. So they're listening to major – you know, a space oddity. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think one of the, the – we'll get a lot more detail here once once we do get into the main story because the, 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 page, the chapter three that just started uh, – is essentially or is largely a flashback, all right? And we see Finn and Rexstar in some kind of. It's a little hard to tell if they're actually slaves or or just working class stiffs with nothing to live for, or you know, it's basically a, a not pleasant situation, regardless. Right. Um, and we kind of start to get a sense of how they came to be and. Uh, and we're starting to see how they're getting along with one another. And and I think that's going to lead to uh, why Rexstar has this um, affinity for Finn, even though Finn is, you know, kind of going around wacky and goofy and causing all sorts of problems. Right. Um, you know, it just dawned on me, I think earlier we had said that this started in 2015 actually it began in july of 2014 oh really yeah because as you were saying this i was looking at the the calendar which also functions as its archive you know th- that's another thing we usually point out you know does a webcomic have a discernible and navigable um archive and so their archive is a calendar on the uh, the blog and the archives go back to July 2014 and then August yeah. 2014. So, okay, I guess I because there isn't as much here, I just thought that it started last year, uh, but I guess I was mistaken. So this isn't coming out consistently once a week. Yeah, that's – I only kind of stumbled across it, uh, you know, I don't know. I want to say late summer, early fall – last year and because there were so few updates i assumed as much as well um interesting though um he's i mean it's not that um the comic has stalled per se though right it's he's got updates uh you know you go back through there's there's updates at least on a monthly basis as far as i can see um so it's not like he's taken an an extended hiatus at any point so um it must be that there there were the occasional blip, blips here and there where he wasn't able to get a, an update in place or something. Mm. But, you know, another thing that I noticed that this creative team does uh, – now, I mean, this is not unusual. Uh, between chapters, uh, they take breaks, as many webcomic creators do, mm-hmm. and either they will – well, if they put up anything at all. They will either put up something that is maybe a sketch or maybe a supplemental one or two page tangential story to the main storyline, or often they'll have fans and readers um, who have contributed their representation, their versions of you know the, the creation. Uh, they'll feature those. Um, I've noticed that with Rexstar. They do that between chapters, but they also do it during and within chapters, and they do it often. Um, I don't think that this disrupted the reading process for me, although there were a couple of occasions where I wondered, why are you continuing to interrupt the story with other art or fan art or sketches? 
but again, I don't know what goes on in the creation. It could be that there was a problem with you know getting things up or getting the art ready in time. Who knows? Any any number of, of things. Uh, but there are quite a number of supplemental pages and entries that are going up on Rexstar that have really not much of anything to do with the main storyline that that's being told here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, the, the problem, uh, I don't want to say a problem necessarily, but the challenge, I guess, with a lot of web comics um, is that, you know, the, the, unless you have one of those big name ones uh, that really makes a big splash and gets a lot of attention, uh, a lot of them don't make a lot of money from the web comic th- itself. Right. Uh, and, and particularly if you've got multiple people working on it, when you'd have to split whatever revenues you do get as well, right? So uh, a lot of these webcomic artists uh, and creators out there are working on their webcomic as essentially a second job, right? right. They they work in uh, a design studio or, or whatever uh, from 9 to 5 and then come home and put another 5, 6, 7 hours in uh, into their webcomic. So... What that means is that when something goes south in any capacity, you know, like a a relative gets sick or they they have some kind of personal emergency, uh, that means that the stuff that isn't making as much money gets put on hold for, for some period of time, unfortunately. Oh, exactly. And that's completely understandable. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just noticed that there are a number of pauses just within these first two chapters that we get. Uh, but again, I mean, you know, I don't think it really disrupts uh, the enjoyment of the main storyline. And another thing about this site is they do allow space for readers to comment on what happens. And, you know, some of the entries have several. Uh, discussion common points and others one or none at all but it looks like there is pretty good reader participation at at least early on in this story because i'm just scrolling through now and uh you know that that's that is a good sign of how active uh the readership is you know do you have a lot of people reading this and then along with that do you have readers that want to comment and even engage in the storytelling itself uh it We've talked, both you and I and then uh, even Wolverton and I, when he was doing the webcomic show, on how at times uh, disruptive, even annoying, the comment section can be for certain webcomics. Um, I, I don't find this intrusive. I don't find it disruptive. I don't think the creators are mentioning anything that would approximate a spoiler. So, so you know, that's fine, uh, the way that this is laid out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and, and you mentioned the the interactivity with the uh, with their audience, and I think that's even doubly noticeable uh, from the the fan art that they post. Right, the fact that they're getting fan art, people are saying, "I enjoy this comic enough that I want to draw these characters in my style or or contribute in some way." Um, you know, and that's you know, well, they'll post some of that when they're you know, taking a break of, of between chapters or whatever. Um, and I think that says a lot to the audience that they're building up and uh, the, the I don't know if devotion is the right word, but the certainly the, the level of interest uh, among their audience. Right. So, you know, this is one, again, we don't have as much story content to, to go on, but uh, what's there is quite promising. Yeah, they've got, uh, they do have a great handle on the on the characters. Um, and you know, I, we've made the, the Abbott and Costello and, and Martin and Lewis analogies, but you know, they're really not, uh, they don't feel like they're just aping those characters or, or those actors. Uh, the, 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 the characters that we're looking at here, uh, Rexstar and Wyoming are both fully fledged characters in their own right. Um, and they, they do have that straight man, joke man kind of quality to them, but they're, they're certainly motivations and interests there beyond just a flat stereotype yeah and then the world that they're on right now um there's a lot of potential in what this well city if we can call it a city is all about uh because there seems to be several sisters who are in charge or in or at least in positions of authority in this city and um, one of them, at least, 
uh, Wyoming is, is interested in, he has the hots for. Well, I get the impression that Wyoming would have any interest with any <laughs> any woman with legs, basically. <laughs> so probably nothing extraordinary there, frankly. Yeah, that's true. But there is one sister of, of those that we've met so far in this town that he seems to be particularly drawn to. It's the one that they delivered the package to, the one mm-hmm. who has the glasses, and her glass her glasses are actually only, what, one lens. Yeah. But it's not a monocle. No, yeah, it's an, it, it, some interesting design work going on there too. Um one of the one of the challenges certainly with any science fiction type of story is uh not only telling the story but developing the the look and feel of it, right? I mean, that's you don't want to uh you want to make it look futuristic and different um and you don't want to look like you're copying Star Wars or Star Trek or or Flash Gordon or anything. Uh, and I think they do that here uh, with the character designs as well as the spaceships and, and whatnot. Exactly. And in fact, if you go to the website, again, it's rexstarcomic.com, uh, they do have a page for world and characters. And right now, the only thing you'll find up on this roster is, you know, the two main characters, Thade Rexstar and Finn Wyoming. The only other character is their spaceship, Daisy. Which uh, I, I'm sure is a reference to 2001. You would uh, hope, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, I can't imagine it wouldn't be. But unlike Hal uh, in that uh, in that story, is you know the the Daisy here has a lot more personal affection for the characters, and there's a lot more uh, I, down. I would say out, downright love, uh, almost at a romantic level for the two of them. Right. Um, You know, on the topic of spaceships, uh, let us use this occasion to update our listeners on a webcomic that you and I discussed several months back, and that's uh, Space Mullet, because we commented on how how wonderful he was at at rendering spaceships in Mm -hmm. in intricate detail. Uh, You know, that was solicited a couple of months ago. Um, and I, th- I think it's Dark Horse, yeah, that's going to yeah. be publishing that. Did you had mentioned that there was going to be? I think you had hinted about it, but you you didn't give anything away. Remember? Yeah, At the time, um, you said I, you you've you've heard because you knew the creator. Yeah, you know I've, the creator. I've talked to the creator several times, and uh, when I had talked with him. Uh, at that point, uh, he was in discussions with Dark Horse, I believe, uh, but they hadn't find, signed on the dotted line. So he he was fairly certain that was going to go through, but it had not at that point. Yeah. So if you have checked out Space Mullet and you'd like the webcomic, as we suggested that you would, and if you're like me, you want to get a hard copy of that mother, then, hey, it's going to be coming out later this year. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. I, I think it's going to look absolutely fantastic in print. Well, before we move on to the last title that we're discussing, uh, let's remind our listeners that one of our sponsors and a sponsor that helps us get through all the comics that we read is Just Coffee Co-op. You know, we read we read a lot, so we need to stay awake, and we need that caffeine to help us stay awake. If you go to their website, justcoffee.coop, You can find all the kind of uh, coffees that they have, and on checkout, please be sure to use our coupon code, COMICS. You'll get 10% off of your order, and remember, shipping is free. Definitely a good deal, Uh, and some fantastic sounding. I haven't tried everything yet, but they have some some fantastic sounding uh, flavors available, too. Right, exactly. And, and at the same time, you know, you're you're patronizing a business. I mean, not only are you helping the Comics Alternative when you get your copy there and use our coupon code COMICS, but you're also patronizing a business that does really good things, right? So this is free trade, it's organic, and they do a lot for the environment as well. 
that's honestly it's exactly the type of operation that that I want to support and, and I'm really pleased that they're uh, that they've stepped up and are supporting us uh, with with uh, advertising yeah okay so the last title that we're going to be discussing the already completed web comic is Jason young Bluths is that how you pronounce his name young Bluth or young bluff uh, I've always gone with young bluff but I don't think I've ever actually heard it spoken out loud Okay, so Either way. Jason, we'll call it Young Bluth. So Jason Lung Bluth's Weapon Brown, and in fact, this is a, a particular storyline of Weapon Brown. This is Blockhead's War. Uh, you can find this web comic at www.whatisdeepfried.com, and in fact, Young Bluth has several web comics up you would just go to the weapon brown one from that main website now this storyline um, blockheads war ran from january 2013 to september 2014 and you know you're the one who introduced me to weapon brown i have to say sean of all the web comics we've been discussing on the web comic series for for now over a year this has to be one of the most entertaining and interesting in a variety of different ways that I've read. It's it really is a fantastic concept and it just brilliantly executed, I think. And both at a at a, you know, storytelling level and at an ex, at an illustration level. Um oh, definitely. So as, as a little background, a uh, young blood um was doing a variety of web comics largely around the uh, his kind of deep, what he called deep fried and that's uh the the domain name that he's got this under what is deep fried and those were all kind of there were some one note jokes basically uh, and uh he's got a, a clown character that uh, kind of an uh, a demented clown character that he he toys around with that's it's, it's interesting and clever and and, and engaging in that um, and then a few years back, he threw out uh, this, I think it was only like six or eight pages story uh, call, uh, for his first installment called Weapon Brown. And the idea is, what if Charlie Brown and the whole Peanuts cast lived in a post-apocalyptic future? <laughs> so, right? So they're all they're all adults now, but Charlie Brown has buffed himself up. He lost his arm some way and, and has a, a, a cybernetic arm now. Uh, Snoopy is still tagging along with him, but is, is a very kind of mean and vicious attack dog. He's Snoop. He's just called... Yeah, one of the, one of the interesting things I, I should point out is it's very clear that, he's, that, that Young Bluff is referencing all the Peanuts characters, but he's very careful not to tread on any trademarks. Uh, he's uh, Weapon Brown is always called Weapon Brown. It's never Charlie Brown at any point. He's never called Charles at any point. Well, he's uh, called Chuck. I think he's, he may be called Chuck once or twice, but uh, but that's about as close as it gets, right? It's um, but it's still it's one of those interesting fine trademark lines where where Young Bluff is walking right up to the edge of showing, you know, of, of trap tra tra yeah, traipsing on. Uh, Charles Schultz's copyright, but not quite going over that line, or at least as far as I can tell. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but um, in any event, uh, so Young Bluff got such a great reaction off of this uh, short story that he did. He's developed the character in that world a lot more, and so what we have with Blockheads War now is a full-length graphic novel, still featuring Weapon Brown and Snoop. Uh, but this time they're on a full-blown adventure that incorporates pretty much the full history of comic book strips uh, in this post-apocalyptic future. And boy, is it extensive. He hits just about every major comic strip character I've ever heard of, and a lot that I just I barely even remember hearing about in histories. Classic, uh, obscure... Uh, foundational, older, contemporary. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, and what's interesting is that they all 
uh, this, regardless of the original genre of the strip that he's pulling from, uh, he w- is able to work in not only the work all the characters into this into this one cohesive world, um, but he does so in a very elegant way that is very that they very much keeps in line with what the original strip was about anyway. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, we're talking about, say, Little Abner, right? He was this little podunk town with all these yokels and, and very kind of, uh, you know, uh, backwards living people. Um, but even though we're looking at the future, because it's this post-apocalypse, he's got them all in pretty much the same clothes. And it makes sense because <laughs> it's apocalypse. And so no one is, has the resources to buy new shoes. So they go around barefoot. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's a military industrial complex, which still is thriving because, you know, that's what militaries do. And it's all the characters you remember from Beetle Bailey. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of that kind of disparate, uh, disparate, genres and and ideas and tones that he all pulls together in one very cohesive way right uh and and, you know every character major and minor in weapon brown in this storyline especially um uh, blockheads war and if i'm if if i'm not mistaken of the various Weapon Brown narratives, this longest, which is Blockhead's War, that's the only one that's a webcomic, right? Uh, that's the only one that's still available as a webcomic. I believe okay. he's, uh, he's had them all up online at some point. I don't okay. know if they're all still available, though. Okay. Um, but if you go to the website again, what is deepride.com, and then you eventually click through to Weapon Brown, you, they have a list of many, but not all of the main characters. And, of course, there's Chuck, you know, Weapon Brown. Uh, and, and it's funny um, – the W in weapon is also on the front of his shirt, and it looks like that squiggly pattern on Charlie Brown's shirt. And he has that curly Q hair on the front of his forehead, and of course he's bald. Uh, but if this uh, Chuck is much more grizzled than Charlie is. Uh, and then you have Snoop, of course, based on Snoopy. But then we have this uh, syndicate, right, which is is based on United uh, Syndicate. And the uh, the chairman is named Chairman Horns, and he is based off uh, the boss, the pointy-haired boss from Dilbert. Mm-hmm. Um, Someone who is leading the opposition to the syndicate is Annie, who is blind and who has these blank eyes. And, of course, we know who that is. <laughs> uh, and then one of her uh, right-hand men is Huey X, you know, from – he and he is from the boondocks, as he tells us. And, of course, we know what that's referring to. And, in fact, uh, Huey's brother – oh, what's Huey's brother's name in the comic strip? Uh, he plays a major part as well. And then uh, another right-hand man for uh, of, of Anne's is someone by the name of Pops, who has an extremely butt-ugly face, uh, who smokes a corncob pipe, and who has these humongous arms, and who just happens to eat spinach. And what's it, what, what I also like, too, is that he's, a, if you go back to the, the syndicate side, not only is the pointy-haired boss from Dilbert there, but we see... Uh, the King from The Wizard of Id, uh, General Half-Track from uh, Beetle Bailey, uh, basically all of the adversaries in the comic strips end up working in that same syndicate. Uh, I exactly. Think, I think Duke, Duke from Boonesbury, yeah. Right, is, is, is another one of those. And so, yeah, so this, uh, this nefarious syndicate, as it's called, of course, you know, is, is based on United Features Syndicate. And it has uh, overrun, or at least the syndicate wants to overrun this post-apocalyptic world. And the reason why they're trying to get to Annie and the rebels is because... In this storyline, Blockhead's War, um, they have – oh, God, how, how are we going to describe this now? They have, they have discovered a source of food in a world without much resources anymore because it's been decimated by atomic warfare, um, that there is this large creature called the Garf. 
<laughs> you know, that looks like Garfield. It's got a face and a top like Garfield, but then it's this this long lower region which looks like um, a worm, a tapeworm, I guess. And as things go into the Garf, it's digested in the output through the tail – is this weird, malleable material that they end up calling shmoo. Uh, (laughs) uh, Again, going back to little Abner. And the thing about this material shmoo is it looks and tastes like whatever you expect or want something to look or taste like. So if you want to eat candy, then you take some shmoo and it'll taste like candy. And and it's also very nutritious. So in this post-apocalyptic world, I mean, this is the main source and probably about the only major source of, um, of, of sustenance that the world has right now. And so that's why the syndicate is wanting to – you know, to, to attack the rebels and get their hands on the Garf or the source of the shmoo. Yeah. This sounds weird. It really does sound weird. <laughs> and you have to read this. And, you know, I, I said before we started to discuss this in detail that this has to be one of the most fascinating webcomics I've ever read uh, for this podcast. And I do not say that lightly. I mean, we've read a lot of great stuff. This is a fantastic webcomic. Yeah, and you know it's it's there's a lot of uh, a lot of thought went into this. I mean, it's like I I think I, you and I talked a little bit beforehand, and and I said that in the the initial description it sounds like a one note joke. It'll last maybe four or five pages, and you go aha, that's that was clever, and then you move on. Uh, but he but what Young Bluff has done here is he's crafted a really solid legitimate story right regardless separating out the whole references to the comics and and peanuts and all of that it's still a solid story in and of itself right even if you take away all those references he's got a great story of a character who is you know your hero loner character who comes by tries to save uh the the band of rebels from the evil empire you know that kind of thing it's a it's a kind of a classic story motif in in a lot of ways um, and he just applies the very smartly applies the comic strip genre, I guess, or medium over top of that. Um, and it, he just does an expert job of, of making sure all of these pieces connect with each other very well. Uh, and it's, it's some very clever little bits. One of the I just it dawned on me, I almost forgot. There's a sequence where. Weapon Brown is going through the wastelands, and he's attacked by these uh, mutants that are dressed basically in loincloths and rolling around on a single wheel, a la BC. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and you look at that and you go, wow, I, I, I wouldn't have thought you could have gotten BC in this apocalyptic future, but there it is, and it makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And in fact, there are, you know, as you pointed out earlier, references to comics, both classic and contemporary, woven throughout. And and some of these are going to be obvious, but some are not so obvious or very subtle. For instance, maybe a character in the far background that if you look close enough, and in fact, if you're reading this as I do, or as I did, on a tablet, and you kind of zoom in or pull out to where you can see a little more detail about you know, a small figure in the background, you can see that even that is based on you know, some kind of comic reference from you know, the old newspaper strip. So, I mean, a lot of thought went into this, and I, I mean, I don't know what the other Weapon Brown stories were like that preceded this one. But this had to have taken a long, long time to create. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it did. Um, and a lot of research going back, too. I mean, uh, yeah. you have to be very, for for Young Luth to pull out a lot of the references that he does, uh, he's got a, he must have put in a ton of research going through the, the old archives of newspaper strips. You know, because you can, you can do a handful of characters off the top of your head, uh, but you start pulling in all of these obscure ones page after page after page for uh, the entire length of a graphic novel. Uh, that that takes some work. That takes some research uh, to make sure you don't miss anybody. 
Right. Oh, and I can't believe we haven't mentioned this yet. And I don't think that this is a spoiler, but there is – okay, the the main figure that the syndicate uses or in essence creates in order to overcome Annie and her fellow rebels is someone who goes by the initials C-A-L or Cal. And this creature – and he, he's, a, he's a deadly killer. Um, and he doesn't give a damn about anything, and he carries a tiger toy <laughs> <laughs> um, who, you know, later on in the narrative becomes more than just a stuffed animal. It, 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 I, oh, God. There, and, and the reason I mentioned the character Cal at this point, because you know how um, – you know, a, a popular and and plagiarized image of Calvin is him peeing, uh, mm. and you know, with this mich- mischievous grin. And you see this on the back of trucks and things of that sort. And I don't even know where the hell that came from, really. But there is a scene where Cal is going to an outhouse of this one diner, and he's 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 taking a piss in an outhouse, and the way that he's drawn. The look on his face and the way that his face is kind of turned to where he's looking back at you as he's taking a piss, it's the exact same image, practically, of that plagiarized image you see on the back of, let's say, truck windows around the country. Yeah, of Calvin yeah. taking a piss on something. You know, there's a lot of neat little references like that, too. Uh, there's another shot when uh, Cal and Weapon Brown actually get into a fight very late in the story. And uh, Cal throws his, uh, I, I think it was a, a ball of schmoo, if I remember correctly. Oh, I know what you're referring to now. Yeah, yeah. and he throws it at Weapon Brown as an, as a projectile. It hits Weapon Brown, and Brown goes spinning around, loses all his clothes in exactly the same way that Charlie Brown <laughs> gets hit with a baseball on that pitcher's mound every time. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, I, and there's there's little references like that throughout the whole thing it it makes complete sense if you're familiar with the the history uh and and it all ties together and you just chuckle to yourself for all these little bits throughout the whole thing but what's nice is that it's not necessary to read the story or it's not necessary to uh to know all these references to get the story i guess i should say um you know you could you could lift like i said you could do this entire story not know a single one of these characters uh, and where they're from, and it still works very well as a story on its own. Right. And now, we should mention at this point, that because I, I want to talk about the art... Uh, in in a moment about the 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 detailed intricate art that we find with Weapon Brown, but you know earlier we were discussing uh, Delilah Dirk and we called it an all age comic. This is not that. You cannot say the same thing about <laughs> Weapon Brown, and in fact there are parts of this that to call it risque it may be even an understatement. Um, this gets downright pornographic in places. Now, I have no problem with that, but if you're a webcomic reader and your sensibilities are a little more delicate than mine and Sean's, then just know that there are going to be certain scenes in Weapon Brown that may surprise you. And I'm not just talking about getting to see uh, Annie's breast, because you do, Um but there's a lot more that goes on in this, and it just gets wild. And th- I mention this as a way of getting to uh, Young Bluth's art. I tell you what it reminded me, both in terms of its artistic, his artistic style and the content, especially the parodic content. This reminds me of something you would find in a pornographic version, maybe, in classic Mad Magazine or even Mad Comics. And so it reminded me, uh, especially with the with the more risque part, of the art that you would find, let's say, from a classic Wally Wood or mm. Jack Davis or, or, or something like that. It has that quality to it, uh, down to 
the various expressions that some of the characters have and the detail that went into the anatomy and the setting and all of that, it just struck me as something that if it were toned down in in terms of the sex and even the violence a bit, this would be something that you could find in a classic Mad Magazine or a Mad Comic book. Well, you know, the only other thing you'd have to tone down to is the language. There is oh, okay, the language. <laughs> yeah, there's there's quite a bit of swearing throughout this as well. So, yeah. uh, if you're offended at all by that, that's uh, something else to be wary of. It's very much, uh, you know, I, and I think it works for the story in the sense that Youngblood is trying to show just how rotten and horrible this post-apocalyptic future is. And he does that in by showing all the depraved things that are going on and that that we have in humanity, right? Not there's all the swearing, the language is is absolutely gone to pot. Uh, you know, the depravity level has been uh, kind of gone off the scale to the point where you know people are uh, having sexual intercourse in front of other people as that's just a you know day to day occurrence, basically. You know, right. Um, and we get you know we get this almost at the very beginning because when we first see Chuck or Weapon Brown he's on a mission he he's been contracted to to get oh what's her name Buxley Miss Buxley yes Miss Buxley yes um from i guess it is Oh, the 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 people who are taking her away in a tank, and of course, Beetle Bailey Star, Sarge is one of those guys, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so he he saves her, and uh, oh, let me see, how do I explain this or how to describe this? Her breasts are in a locked brazier, so kind of a chastity brazier, and uh, Chuck ends up unlocking them, and we immediately see him begin to suckle, let's just say, uh, <laughs> and then what he takes in, he, he, he stops as he's sucking and says, uh, are you pregnant by any chance? And then basically what she has hidden inside of her anatomy, let's say, is some schmoo. Uh, and so this is what introduces the whole schmoo storyline, which is developed much further as the story continues. Uh, but I mention this because this happens in the opening pages of Weapon Brown, this storyline. And so you very quickly get to not just the violence, but also the sex in this comic. Yeah, he's uh, he's very upfront about, uh, like I said, making this world look as depraved as possible, uh, and and he does that in in every manner from start to top, from start to finish, top to bottom, across the board. He's he's showing you that this is really just a horrible, horrible place. Yeah, you know, I would like to see um, a website where someone has gone through meticulously noting and annotating what all of these character settings and occasions refer to. That would be great. I mean, there is a Wikipedia page devoted to Weapon Brown, but it's primarily devoted to those earlier stories, especially the Charlie Brown or the Peanuts characters. But you don't get near as much with this much longer storyline, Blockhead's War. And it would be great if if there were and if there is i'm not aware of it someone who is who has just sat down taken the time to to annotate all of these references and and all it just because there there there's tons here this is a very sophisticated webcomic well you know what what jason himself has done though is on each installment of every page update that he's got for this book he's added he's at least added tags uh at the bottom of each one citing which comics that he's using in that page. So you might not get like the specific reference, okay, this is when Charlie Brown gets hit by the baseball on the pitcher's mound. Uh, but he does say, okay, this is the character from Ash Shag, or this is uh, the character from For Better or Worse, or, you know, whatever. Uh, and he does make those references in the in the tags at the bottom of each installment. So you at least get, even if you're not familiar with the comic, you can kind of go back and get at least some sense of, oh, that's supposed to be, you know, Little Lulu, or that's supposed to be Andy Cap, or whatever. Yeah, he'll put those in the tag. And another thing that he'll put along with the tag is one panel from 
an old peanut strip. And I guess in most cases, you can make a link between what's happening in his current story at the time, Weapon Brown, and what is being said in this one panel from a peanut strip. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, actually, I was, I was just thinking uh, another thing I'd be curious to see, <laughs> just for my own amusement, is if somebody recreated the entire storyline, but using the original art styles from the from the comics. Uh, you know, so instead of seeing Weapon Brown, you actually have a picture of Charlie Brown drawn by Charles Schultz. And instead of, uh, you know, Huey Freeman, mm-hmm. we actually have... Uh, or Huey X, uh, we have Huey Freeman as drawn by Aaron Magruder, you know, that kind of thing. And right. actually, actually drop all that. I'd, I'd be kind of curious to see uh, how that would look, uh, sitting in that kind of juxtaposition of these cute cartoon characters against these violent, uh, depraved acts and, and terrible language and all that. Uh, it would be an interesting experiment. Yeah. You know, you mentioned those tags. One of the things I was was looking at just now, you know, if you wanted to find instances of, uh, let's say, okay, there's, I'm looking at one page here. This is installment 337. And of course, Anne is on there. So if I click on the Anne tag, it gives me a rundown of all the pages where Anne shows up. And of course, there's a lot. Uh, So you can find where each of these characters, or at least comics, are mentioned throughout Weapon Brown. It would be great, though, if there were something like a table of contents where all of these, all of the tags were available so you could see what uh, all of the references that are being made. So you Mm. may not have, you know, detail as to which panel within that installment you will find this reference, visual or otherwise. But again, that gets back to what I was uh, wanting there to be some kind of larger annotative type product. And, you know, that would be. That would make for one hell of an omnibus edition if he wanted to. I know he's printed this up as a kind of traditional graphic novel, but, uh, you know, it, to add that kind of uh, extra set of extras would be a huge effort. But but I would certainly appreciate that as well. Mm. Now, um, Young Bluff, he's currently doing his um, his deep fried comic, right? Is he still doing that? He's still doing that, yeah. Um, I don't know that he has a regular schedule, per se, but uh, he's still making updates periodically to that strip. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that threw me at first when you recommended this, uh, that, we, that we look at Weapon Brown, is if you go to his website, if you go to whatisdeepfried.com, and then you see, um, you know, the different projects that he has, the... You know, I guess one off um, deep fried comic, it is a very different tone and certainly a different art style mm-hmm. than Weapon Brown. And that threw me because it, you, you, were, you were describing it one way. And then when I went to the website, I ended up looking, I think, initially at deep fried. And I thought, OK, uh, this seems more like a gag strip than anything. <laughs> yeah, it's actually and that's that was one of the things that struck me, too. Um it, when he first did like that that first installment of Weapon Brown, because I re- I saw that when he first launched it, uh, you know, several years mm-hmm. back, and that was a very interesting departure from the the deep fried strip. It still had some of his you know some semblance of his humor involved with it, um, but he treated that as a very different type of comic, and he approached it differently from an artistic perspective, from a storytelling perspective. Uh, it, it's it it almost looks it does not look like the same artist at all really um but i i think that goes to show you know what his artistic and storytelling chops really are that he's able to do these multiple different styles and multiple different uh genres in equal aplomb right mm-hmm. uh you know that he's able to go back and forth I, I don't. He doesn't switch back and forth them like very regularly, but when he do, he is able to switch back and forth between these kind of gag strips and you know this kind of dark, serious, uh, you know, like I think you made reference to like a Wally Wood type of style. Um, you know, he's he's able to switch back and forth between those, not just for little one-offs, but for extended storylines. I think that's very impressive. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering. Why we don't hear more of Jason Youngbluth 
um, given the just sheer sophistication of Weapons Brown? The, the only thing I've been able to think of is just that that level of raunchiness that he gets to. Is it's, it's very much not an all ages story, right? So, you, you first second will never touch this, right? <laughs> but what what about Fantagraphics? I mean, Weapon Brown is perfect for Fantagraphics. Yeah. Now uh, I can't explain why it wouldn't have gone to to somebody like that. Maybe he hasn't taken it to them, or maybe they, you know, or you know anybody else. Maybe he just has chosen uh, not to shop it around. I don't I don't know, quite frankly. Um, but uh yeah it's absolutely something that um i'm surprised hasn't i at one level i'm surprised that it hasn't gotten more traction um but on the on the other hand like i said because of that level of depravity uh and it does skirt some ip issues uh that might make some publishers a little leery yeah. um i think between those two i think the that's maybe why there that's not something that a major publisher hasn't immediately jumped on. Right. That's that, Those are my guesses. I don't know if he's actually... Uh, maybe it's just uh, that he wants his own creative freedom and doesn't want to, to be weighed down with a, an actual publisher and just to do his own thing. It could be. And, you know, I looked him up on, or at least uh, looked up Weapon Brown on Amazon.com, and it's published by Death Ray Graphics. Now, that's his publishing yeah, that's uh, that's right. basically just so, him. Yeah, so it's basically self-published, and you have the omnibus edition, which I guess has all of the Weapon Brown stories, right? Not just the uh, um, Blockhead, Blockhead's War story that we're discussing. Well, I don't, I don't have a omnibus edition. I have he has published all of them in various capacities, though, and I do have uh, printed copies of I think every Weapon Brown story that he's done so far. Okay, yeah, so this says Weapon Brown Omnibus. Uh, parenthetically, it says Omnibus. And this came out in April of 2014, So, and it's 416 pages, so this may have that, all of the all of the stuff, uh, the Weapon Brown stories in there. Yeah, that does sound like it would contain about everything, because I think the Blockhead's War story is, I want to say, 300 pages? 300-some, Three, yeah. Yeah, 300-some pages. Um, so, yeah, another couple hundred would would make sense that sounds about right and by the way it, uh, it does indicate that young bluff does or he is a regular contributor to mad magazine that totally makes sense yeah <laughs> i can totally see that especially with uh his deep fried comic that's uh uh you know there's there's a lot I, I think there's a lot of interesting subversiveness, both in, in Weapon Brown, certainly, but also the Deep Fried comic. He talks uh, not only the, the specific IPs with Weapon Brown, but the, with Deep Fried, he gets into a lot of kind of cultural, social issues as well. Right. In fact, I was just looking at what appears to be the most, well, maybe it's not the most recent, um, installment, and that came out... Actually, no. Though it is the most recent installment, it came out last year in May, and the this this strip is called Roadkill, Master of the Healing Arts on the Shout Out in Garland, Texas. So he does deal with timely issues. So in the, this is if you remember, uh, you know, last year there was the the whole there was some some gunfire in my neck of the woods uh, because of Pamela Geller and some art exhibition that was going on that had images of uh, or or something going on that had images of the uh, of the Prophet Muhammad were included. Remember mm. that? I do. Yeah, it does sound vaguely familiar now that you mention it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, that was the the I guess the last time he published a deep fried comic. Um, no, no I, it's, the one I'm looking at right now has a, I believe, as a, uh, uh, a December 31st date. Hmm. Okay, so, okay, now this, this brings up another issue that I wanted to discuss with you inadvertently. Uh, yeah. It brings up an issue. You know, I really, I, I love Weapon Brown, and I like what I've seen of Deep Pride, but I have to tell you, the design of this website needs a little bit of work. Mm -hmm. It's, it's... If not completely confusing, it's slightly confusing at times, 
and certain links don't take you where you expect to go. Now, what I did to get to the latest installment, or what I thought was the latest installment, is I went to... Okay, th there are two kinds of navigation bars, one above and then one below the comic. And this is the same with Weapon Brown as it is with his strip, Deep Fried, and I guess with uh, the other strip, Clarissa. Mm -hmm. um, and the one on the top, it gives you you know, what you normally get with a webcomic where you can go to the next page or the previous page or the very first installment or the latest but below the strip, you get more variety. And what, how he describe, or, or how this is laid out is, you can go to the next installment in the chapter, I assume. Then there's the next chapter. Then there's the latest in chapter, and then the same thing with previous, right? Previous mm -hmm. in chapter, previous chapter, first in chapter. And I went to the latest chapter, latest in chapter, because there's nothing after. There's nothing more recent when I click next chapter and I get this May 2015 installment uh, on the Garland, Texas shooting. And, and given what I clicked through, I should be able to get to the most recent. So why am I not there? Bottom line, yeah. the navigation is a little contorted. Yeah. And I, and I think the problem, uh, I, I can see where he's coming from, but I, I don't agree with it for exactly the reasons you cite is what he's trying to do is i think make a one-stop shop for all of his comics right regardless if you're interested in deep fried or weapon brown or whatever and the problem is that you run into complications with having to you know essentially creating multiple layers of navigation that are probably more confusing than they need to be i i think he would better be served by making Weapon Brown its own website, right? You know, WeaponBrown.com or whatever. Uh, making Deep Fried its own website. Making Clarissa its own website. Making JasonYoungBluff.com its own website, right? I think he's trying to get one website to do a little too much, and the, the end result is you get this kind of sometimes confusing, not always intuitive navigation structure, unfortunately. Right. Um, yeah. You know, which, you know, the comics are still really good. Yes. Uh, it's just with a little tweaking, he could make this... I mean, even if he didn't separate the various web comics onto their, you know, each a different uh, website with their own domain... You know, he could he could still keep everything here, but make it a little more organized. And uh, you know, but you know, if if that's the only thing that I have to to scratch my head over with uh, Deep Fried, the entire website, th then that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it uh, you know the stories are great. Like I said, you know, there's nothing like Weapon Brown out there. Uh, and there's space for people to comment, and he does have uh, what seems to be a devoted and vocal following. Sure. Uh, so, so, so all of that's good, but um, yeah, just at times a little confusing to get around. But other than that, this is definitely something that our listeners should check out. Weapon Brown. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic piece. And even if you don't like reading long serials online, uh, like you said, there's there's the print version available. You can get the entirety of Weapon Brown uh, through through his link on Amazon as well. Wow, so that was a great comic to discuss. But before that, Sean, we looked at two current ongoing, Delilah Dirk and The King Schilling, and then Rexstar. So all three of those great comics for the month of January. Absolutely, absolutely. Always always fun to, to find these and, and go through them. And it's every, every time, every month that we start doing these, I'm always looking at something different and I'm always thrilled at, at what we're able to come across. Yep. And if you want to find great comics, either in hard copy or digital format, you would do well to visit the websites of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service, and their sister company, MyDigitalComics.com. It's a great place to get your comics. 
whether you like them in hard copy or otherwise. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let me and Sean know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe. It's very simple and easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. The phone number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. And the other alternative, too, is you can certainly email us, which is uh, useful if you're trying to provide links to uh, other web comics that you you're, want us to take a look at. Uh, you can reach us at two guys at comicsalternative.com. That's T W O G U I S. Or you can talk to me directly at Sean at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us on Twitter. We're at the number two guys with PhDs. You can find us as well on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. And, of course, you can find every single one of our episodes as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary we post on our blog. And that's at our website, comicsalternative.com. Um, every way you can get a hold of us we're always appreciative of of whatever thoughts and comments you have whether that's uh you know just saying hey great job guys wait hey you guys suck or hey <laughs> take a look at this other thing i found this is really cool we're always yeah. always great to hear from from everybody oh exactly in fact we uh, some of the web comics that we have discussed over the past few months have been recommendations from our listeners and in fact sometimes creators will contact us and say hey check out my web comic and we do appreciate that absolutely so if you're a web comic creator and you have something to share get in touch with us or if you just want to share with us one of your favorite web comics get in touch until next month i'm derek and i'm sean we'll talk to you later bye-bye